Amen. And uh, I was dancing like that last yesterday on the interstate, right? <laughs> you know, um, let's go on into the sermon. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 15, but I want to recap just a little bit. You know, last week um, we, we started this series and we were talking about, I titled it two different things, but a spiritual, spiritual genetics. And um, I got a subtitle here, We're Not Your Mama's Church. And um, I don't think they put that one out there, did you? You didn't put that one on the CDs, did you? It's not your mama's church because I come up with that. But anyway, that's good. And, um, you know, so we were talking about how, how God, you know, what God invests himself into, how many of you know he affects it? Did y'all know this? Did, did you know did, on, only the power of God can make an axe head float in water? There is no other way for that to happen. Does everybody, and I, I mean, we read the stories and sometimes we hear of everything happening. You know, in the Old Testament, we go back and we go, man, oh man, you know, I had somebody making fun of my hair yesterday. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, I almost started to remind them, but I was in a meeting, I had to be careful. I said, you better be careful, you know, you're not saying go up thou baldy, go up thou baldy. You know, because you remember there was a point in the Bible where some young children were picking at the man of God that way and a bear came out and ate them. <laughs> and it was Jim Caseman that almost said that too. So just, you know, just, just so you'll know. But anyway, we were talking about not being a generic church. Everybody say generic. And we, we give the definition, not having any particular distinctive quality or application, just like a generic restaurant. They never make a name for themselves, you know, and... and um, you know, so, but then we talked about being genetic. Everybody say genetic. And this is pertaining to or influenced by the genesis or origins. And the word genesis there is the origin or creation or the beginning. So when God, when God invested himself into us, how many of you know it was a beginning? It was something different that happened. How many of you remember when you first um, accepted Christ? I mean, if you know, it made a difference in your life, didn't it? He, he made a difference. I mean, he affected me in a particular way. Now, he, he affected me different than he affects other people. But to me, he changed everything about the dynamics of my life. Come on, y'all. He should have did the same thing to you. I mean, you know, the things that I used to be settled in, all of a sudden, I had to let go of some things. Now, how many of you know the church is the same way? So when we were talking about this, you know, we talked about he gave us power to be witnesses. We went into Daniel where it says that we shall do exploits. Everybody say exploits. And I want to get into this a little bit more. We read this portion of scripture last week, but I wasn't able to comment on it a lot because I was running out of time. But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, I always lead people when they first get born again, I lead them to the book of Ephesians. And the reason why I do that is because it gives us a right now position of who we are in Christ. How I many of you know it makes a difference? You know, the, the, the Bible wasn't meant to be read like a book. You don't start in Genesis and go to the end. You need to get the foundation first, redeem, you know, find out that you've been redeemed, and now you can go back and study some of the other things. So in Ephesians 1 and verse 15, it says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith... Will you say those words with me? I heard of your faith. Can we do it again? I heard of your faith. How many of you know your faith needs to be shouting? It, it needs to be something that people see. Y'all, yeah, there is no such thing as covert Christianity. You know, I, I'm serious, you know, we're supposed to be living out loud. You know, my faith, should, my, my faith in Jesus should be shouting who I am in Christ. I mean, people should be, they should get around me and say, uh-oh, there's Rick again. Because they know we're not going to leave it the same when we touch it. Come on, y'all, I mean, I go, I go, I don't do it much, as much as I used to because my mom and dad aren't, aren't here, you know, they're in heaven now. But I used to go to family reunions and I'd see my family roll their eyes when I'd walk in. Oh, Lord, here he comes again. You know, because I, I, just, I just didn't fall, I didn't flow with old family reunion stuff. Do you understand? I came in, I believe I was full of God and I was supposed to impart everything I had. And that rubs some people the wrong way, especially people who don't want to change. You know, and I told you the stories. My, my Aunt Nadine, my Uncle Bobby passed away, you know, and, and I went to her house for the, you know, after the funeral, and I just, all I knew to do was be a witness. Everybody, everybody say, we got to live out loud. 
You know, so I, I told you this. I hid tracks everywhere. Rolled them up in the toilet paper roll, stuck them in the towels. I mean, I put things in there about the love of God everywhere I could find. I mean, I opened dresser drawers and stuck them in, put them on mirrors. I mean, I put them everywhere. You know, and because I wasn't going to be there for that long. But how many of you know, after I left, the residue of Rick was there. <laughs> Changed everything, guys. And my aunt, she said she, she's sitting around and she got depressed. And she said she'd go to the bathroom and a track would fall out of the toilet paper roll. Because I knew how to do it, man. I'd roll it up a couple of rolls in there, you know. And she said, then I'd go somewhere else and there would be one stuck under the, under the pillow. And there'd be another one stuck in a towel somewhere. And she said, I knew it was Rick. <laughs> I mean, guys, your family ought to know who you are. When something godly happens, they should say, I know it was him. I know it was her. Come on, y'all. We're called to make a difference. Well, you know, she said she sat around there and got, you know, lonely and, and depressed and everything, but started reading those tracts. And then turned her heart over to Jesus. Amen. Come on, y'all. And then went to church and testified in the church that she was at. I want you to know I'm here today because of Rick. Because he put tracts all over my house. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You, is your faith screaming? Do the people you are around, or do you allow the world to drown your witness out? So this is the thing, guys. We're, we're genetic. Do you understand this? We are not living this life just to get by. We're living this life of investing, God investing himself into us. And I told you this, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Man, I need to be living out loud. If my faith is not shouting, we totally different again. So for each generation, think about this, y'all. Each generation that comes along, revelation is poured into that generation. So there's an unfolding. Everybody say an unfolding that does take place. How, hey, I got to do How many of you ever use a rotary phone? Raise your hand. How many of you don't even know what a rotary phone is? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Be honest. Now, now let me tell you. A rotary phone, how many of you know this? A rotary phone was a phone that we used to have, and we had, we had party lines. So you had to pick up the phone and listen to make sure nobody else wasn't on it. Or you could just listen because you wanted to hear the gossip going around. <laughs> so you know, oh, there we go. So what you do is you, you would cover the mouthpiece and listen, and you'd hear all about Aunt Betty and Uncle Bob. And, you can hear everything because they were talking on there, you know. And, and finally, you know, my mom and dad, when we had the party line, I remember this. They, if they got on it and they picked it up and they waited five minutes, they went back and got on it, they would start going click, 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 click. They would, they would <laughs> you know, so it would pop on the line and everybody, well, how many of you know, y'all, back then, that was just the way it was. Yep. And then you... <laughs> and that was the six, six. Then you dialed the nine. And then you... I mean, boy, to go back to those days, huh? <laughs> now I ride in my car, and I hit a button on the steering wheel and say, Call Pam. Calling Pam. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. I don't want to go back to rotary days. Come on, y'all, I don't want to do that. Uh, you could kill somebody with that phone. If they broke into your house, that was a good thing. It was heavy enough, and it had a handle on it, so you could grab it and just use it as a weapon. But, but what I'm trying to say is, guys, how many of you know that generation, that was the answer for communication for that generation? Now look at it now. Where are we at now, guys, with communication? Do you realize on this phone right here has more power than the computers that they used to use years ago. In one phone, a room building full of computers couldn't do what one phone does. Now, what, what is that saying? That's saying this, y'all. God unfolds things, and each generation that comes up, there's revelation to be imparted to the generations. But now, here's the challenge. The new generation needs to understand the old. Come on, y'all. And this is church's responsibility to teach the old. Because you can build on something that's in place. It's hard to build on something you don't understand. Young people, this is why it's so important for you to... Please understand, don't nobody get offended, but us old farts are important to you. 
Come on, y'all, because we have, we have some knowledge that you need. Nobody didn't get offended by that, right? That's why my kids always call me that. Dad, you know what your problem is? You're just an old, uh, watch out, boy. Because I do have the insurance on your car, and I can. This old boy knows what to do. Now listen, though. We need the old. Everybody say old. Because we can build on that. So what happened? There's foundational things. And the church needs to understand and remember those things. And then we move into a new time where new technology comes in. Guys, listen. Technology is not bad. God is using it right now to meet the needs and to meet people in other countries that would have never been able to be reached by TV and satellite and radio. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I remember, you know, this was actually a little bit before my time, but um, thank God. But um, one of the things that, that I do remember is how preachers used to say, oh, that TV is just a one-eyed demon. It's just, it's just going to give everything access, you know, it's going to give the devil access into your life. Well, y'all, anything can be that way unless you take it, and we'll look at this, and you redeem it and bring it under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you know I can do evil things with my phone? Come on, y'all. But I can do anointed things with my phone, too. See, I can, I can get on here and I can message somebody and cuss them out. Oh, come on, y'all. But I can also send them a blessing. You see, it's not, it's not the tool that's evil. Oh, come on, y'all. It's not the technology that's bad. It's who's using it. So this is why it's important. Why I got over there, I don't know, but let's just go on. Anyway, young people, you're important to the church. Come on, y'all, tell them, y'all. Young people, you're important to the church. You know, God is going to anoint you to do things that we never could have done, that we never could have stepped into, that we never, this, this is where it's at, y'all, that we don't, have the, we don't have the understanding for some of this stuff. Come on, y'all, amen. But young people do, man. It's nothing for them to just step right in and do this stuff. Nothing for them to, well, we need them. Come on, y'all, say amen to that. Amen. We need the younger people giving their flavor in church. Amen. But we need the older ones too. That ain't in my notes. Now, where do I go? I know where to go, yeah. I'm just cutting up. That he may give you the spirit of wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. And revelation in the knowledge of him. Man, I, I've, seen, I've seen young people get on fire for God, and I've seen old people get on fire for God, and I've seen God win the same people through young and old. It's amazing to me. I told you, I, I got a friend of mine who is an evangelist, and uh, he went to a meeting one time with his mom. And they couldn't, they, the piano player didn't show up for the meeting. And the, the guy that was doing the meeting went out in the congregation and pointed to his mom and said, have you ever played before? And she said, no. He said, you're my piano player tonight. Laid hands on her and she went up and played. He's been playing every since. It was a gift from God. How many of you know we need impartation? But we also need the new so that we can flow and reach the new generation. I don't know why I'm stuck right there, but I am. So if you, somebody in here needed that, grab it and go. Amen. But God gives wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Listen to verse 18. This is where I've been trying to get to now for um, 30 minutes. <laughs> that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. You know, one of the things that we have to understand is that God wants us to understand not only who He is, but understand who He is in this time. How many of you know, I, I say that sometimes when people look at me, well, you know, God's God. But how many of you know, God, God knows how to handle modern technology. Do you know that? He knows how to handle all this stuff. He, he knows how to, you know, I wish, I do, I told Pam not too long ago, I wish God would send everybody a text message. Can you imagine this? I mean, can you imagine everybody's phone in the world? At one time, one group text. I mean, we, I am that I am. 
saying that. Boom! You know, it just goes out. And, and all these people everywhere go, how did that happen? And there would be no way. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing to take place? But how many of you know we'd still have people that wouldn't believe it? Because they don't have the understanding. They just don't have it. So how many of you know we need our eyes open? Everybody say, open my eyes, God. Look at the eyes of your understanding. How many of you know when you open your eye in the morning, the light pours in? How, how many of you have noticed that? You know, I have this thing with me that when I go to bed, I don't, I don't wrestle with sleeping. Anybody else? My head hits the pillow. This boy is gone. Come on, y'all. My wife will tell you, if I toss and turn for an hour, I'm not gonna, probably not going to go to sleep. But now I had this happen. Jackson's bad about this because he's 13 or 14 hours different time than us. It's actually n nighttime there right now. But he'll text us. He'll forget time. At 2.30 in the morning sometimes, my phone will go off because I leave it on. I'm a pastor in case something was to happen to one of you guys. Okay? So I leave my phone on all the time. You know, it lays, don't call me at 2.30 in the morning asking me questions. <laughs> If you do, I will block your number, okay? <laughs> I do know how to use technology, but what I'm saying, well, he'll text me sometimes, you know, and Pam will hear my phone go off, you know, and I'll hear it vaguely because I'm done. I'm gone. And she'll say, who's texting you? Well, I don't know. I had not looked at the phone yet. You know, and I want to tell her, if you're so interested, get up and walk around there and look at it. I mean, I don't care. I ain't got nothing to hide. You know, and, and, uh, but anyway, she'll finally, I'll roll over and I'll look at the phone and he'll ask me a question, you know, and I'll think, you know, I know if I answer him, I'm going to get my mind running. And how many of you know when you get your mind running, you just say, well, fix 10 cups of coffee. <laughs> Go ahead and cook a pot. That's what I call it. I cook coffee. Cook a pot of coffee. Get in the Word. And from 3.30 on, Study. Okay? Why? Because our minds are built this way. This is what we do. So he don't understand that the, he loses track of the time difference. Listen to what it says. When you open your eyes, your natural eyes, I want you to see this because I want you to see how the flow is. When you open your natural eyes, what happens? Your eyes adjust to any light that's in the room. How many of you know this? Now, I've asked you this before. How many of you ever been in total darkness? I mean, you know, total darkness is when you don't have any light for your eyes to adjust to, and it doesn't matter what happens, you will not be able to see in total darkness. Because your eyes can't focus on anything. So you can put your hand right here, and you can't see it. You know it's there, you can touch your nose. But you can't see your hand. Now, how many of you know? Because that light brings entrance into our mind. It opens things up so we can see. Now, our eyes will adjust to light. How many of you agree with that? So I, I want to make sure you can't fuss at me right now. Okay, your eyes will adjust to any light that's in the room. Well, when it comes to our understanding, listen to what he says, that the eyes of your understanding, everybody say eyes of my understanding, would be enlightened. So, y'all, just like natural light does something and enters into your eye sockets and, and you're able to see it changes things for you, so does spiritual light. And this is what God's trying to say. He says, I want you to start to look at things not just naturally, but understand that when I did the work in you, that I, that I made you into the church. And we talked about this. We don't do church. We are church. Come on, y'all. Say it with me. We are the church. Do you realize this? You are the church. So what happens is when He, when he, when he illuminates you, the eyes of your understanding pick up on that light of the Word of God. And it opens things up so you can begin to see. Now, how many of you know, if you're in dark and you start looking and there's some form of light in a room, it opens up, you'll notice that not only will you see the light, you begin to see the things that are illuminated by your eyes adjusting to the light. Now, if you don't, you're going to catch your toe on something. And we've all done that, amen? Don't tell me your little toe's not important. Dislocate it sometime. And you'll find out. But this is what we do, guys. So the same is in the same in the natural. When we open our eyes and the light starts coming in and it illuminates, so does the Word of God enlighten us on the inside. So the eyes of our understanding open and it starts. We see something in the Word. Y'all with me right now? You see something and it catches your attention, and all of a sudden you begin to see things you've never seen before. But not only does it illuminate just that one area. 
How many of you know the entrance of the light into your heart makes it so you, you can begin to see other things? See, see, this is what happened to me. I got introduced to God's love. How many of you know that's a powerful thing? And his love opened me up to receive grace. Grace changed me. Come on, y'all. But it didn't stop there. When I started reading the Word, all of a sudden, I started learning about faith. So what happened? The entrance of his Word revealed other things. Then I started learning about healing. Come on, y'all. Then I started learning about prosperity. Then I started learning that I could have peace. Come on, y'all. Then I started learning that I had power invested in me. Do you see what I'm saying? Just that little entrance when God first showed me his love. And I've told you my story, guys. Do you know what a, you know what a crazy thing? I tell people how I got saved, and they look at me and tell me, you are a nutcase. I mean, they do. And I look at him and say, no, I'm not. Do you understand? God met me right like I asked him to. Because he knew I would not respond to a preacher. So when my father-in-law, before I got saved and before I met Pam, come and introduced me to the gospel, told me about Jesus, and I tell you, I blew cigarette smoke in his face. Told him point blank, when God wants me, he'll speak to me. I don't need a man to do it. God can do it. Well, why would, I, why would I have, I struggle with how I got saved, guys? So, you know, he prayed for me. And, he, and I remember him doing it. He prayed, God, get, and meet him where he's at. Just meet him where he's at. He got on his motorcycle and rode off. First time I seen a preacher riding a motorcycle. <laughs> Thought it was pretty cool. Got on his motorcycle and rode off. And y'all know, y'all know that. I got in my car just a week or two later and was driving crossing Lynch's River Bridge. And God spoke to me out of the back seat of the car. I didn't go, who was that? I knew. You know why? Because that's what I'd asked for. You know, and he didn't slap me. He didn't slay me. He didn't knock me out. He said, it's time, and it's time now. And I said, okay. <laughs> Come on, y'all. God knows how to meet you where you are. He knows how to meet you. And you know, I drove across that bridge. I didn't have, I didn't have a great experience as far as that was concerned. You know, I just knew something in me shifted, something in me changed. I became new, didn't understand it, but I knew something had happened. Walked into my mom and dad's house. As soon as I walked in the door, my mom looked at me and said, something has happened to you. What happened to you? And I told her what happened to me, okay? And she looked at me and went, you're crazy. But Jesus changed me. Come on, y'all. And that great power that he poured into my life, I'm supposed to believe that what he did to get me in to the kingdom of God, he stopped doing once I got in? No, y'all. No. He is a powerful God. Do you understand? He does not start the jet, Carrie, and then tell us to cut the engines off. I mean, right in the middle of takeoff, oh, I mean, all oh, that engine, I mean, it's just pulling us. And all of a sudden, and then the, and then the Lord says, okay, that's enough to turn it off. You know why? Because we would nosedive. That's it. We got to have that power. Everybody say power. Now listen, the eyes of my, I didn't mean to get stuck here this long. Somebody, y'all got to get something out of this. Okay? The eyes of my understanding being enlightened, listen to this, y'all. The eyes of your understanding, the natural eye and your spiritual eye, the light to the soul, the light illuminates how we see God. I don't want to do that yet. All right. That gives, us, that gives us the understanding. Now, let's go a little bit further here. It says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Everybody say calling. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? How many of you know he's invested into us? 
How many of you know what you invest into, you care about? How many of you know God cares about you? Man, He has made an investment into your life, and part of that investment is, is to make you successful here and now. God wants us to succeed. No, he, he doesn't want us to fail. I, I believe with all my heart, he, he wants us to succeed doing what he's called us to do. Amen? Listen, listen we, this is an inheritance in us. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, toward us who what? Believe. Everybody say believe. This is important for us, guys. We need to understand that he has something for us. He, he wants to do something different in us. And it says, that great power that works toward us that, that believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above. And I read this already. Principalities, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this age, not only what's here now, but also that which is to come. How many of you know he just settled the future? So not only has Jesus been given a name above every name now, doesn't matter what comes in the future, any age that comes after this, Jesus still sits in that place. Every name, every name after this that could come. Hey, let me do it this way, y'all. Every new disease, every new technology, everything like that. You know, the big thing right now is artificial intelligence. How many of you are crazy like me and love reading about this kind of stuff? Nobody else. I guess I have to preach this somewhere else then. But how many of you know AI is one of the things right now that they are really, they're really focusing on? People are working hard, Japan especially, and China are working hard to create artificial intelligence that can, that can make decisions without being emotional. Now let me tell you how close this is. Will you all bear with me for just a minute? Everybody with me? Some of these young people, they're like this. All right? How many of you ever heard of algorithms? How many of you know algorithms do the same thing? They make a decision based on a base program. And, you know, when you go and you fill out a resume for a job, a lot of these places now have algorithms and programs. That's what they call them. They scan your resume, and if your resume does not meet a certain criteria, it'll just kick it out. You never get an opportunity. You could be trained, but your resume could be bad, and you'll never get chosen for the job because your resume is not set right. Come on, am I right, Pam? So what they'll do is they'll scan your resume in, and if you don't have keywords, there's people that can teach you how to do this, you don't have keywords in the right place, it won't pick up on them, and it'll just kick you out, and you'll never get an opportunity for it. Everybody say algorithms. It's already happening, guys. People are using computers to do all this kind of stuff. You know, I, I was just not too long ago, I, I saw a preacher, and I couldn't believe this, and uh, he was putting out a poll just to see what people wanted him to preach on. Because he didn't want to offend anybody. He just, he just want. well, why don't you just put a big old dial on you and dial a sermon? <laughs> We're anointed to preach, guys, and to preach the Word of God. I'm sorry I said that anyway. <laughs> put a quarter in. You can get your own sermon. Get your good word for today. Put a quarter in. I can't believe I just did that anyway. <laughs> Now let me show you where you are in this, Ephesians 2 and verse 4. How many of you love the book of Ephesians? Can I challenge you? How many, of, how many of you have read the whole book of Ephesians? How many of you know you need to do it again? So would you please do me a favor, start in it again this week and read it. This is one of the books that I read all the time. I was sitting in a church service one time and the preacher was preaching a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Not good stuff, bad stuff. And I learned real quick, I just opened to the book of Ephesians. I don't have to make a spectacle. I don't have to stand up and say, shut up! <laughs> Come on, y'all. What I can do is I can open up the book of Ephesians and I begin to read who I am in Christ because that's what he was attacking, is who I was in Christ. So what I did was I made my foundation sure because I trust God's word over man's word any day. Come on, y'all. So I've sat in church services before, and Pam knows it. She'll look at me, and I'm reading the book of Ephesians. So I understand. You can't do that here because I preach the word. So keep an eye on the mushers. No, I'm just joking. 
Listen to what it says in Ephesians 2, verse 4. Listen. But God, who is rich in mercy. Everybody say rich in mercy. Hey, what does it mean to be rich? Over and above. So how many of you know God just don't... I mean, he, he don't have just a drop of mercy. He has abundance. How many of you know he's rich? Everybody say rich. Isn't that a good word? He's rich in mercy. And this is what he says. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now listen to this, verse 6. If you, how many of you have your Bibles open right now, or your, your iPads or devices or whatever? Verse 6 is what I want you to highlight, if you will. And raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That should spark your fire. That should ignite you. You want to know your place? You know, I can't tell you how many times, this is why I teach people, guys, when you first get saved, please to make it a normal part of your Bible study to read the book of Ephesians. Because it always brings things back to where you're supposed to be. See, it's easy to get caught up in all the stuff and get caught up in the understanding. Well, you know, you know I, I had somebody not too long ago tell me, well, you know, I just guess that God chose me as a vessel of dishonor. And I looked down and I said, what are you talking about? God don't have vessels of dishonor. Because Jesus made us all worthy. Come on, y'all. I mean, the only way you can be a vessel of dishonor... Oh, y'all, come on. The only way you can be that is if you're counting on religion and not God. Because God don't make anything dishonorable. He, I mean, he's, he's full of honor. I mean, for this person, I wanted to grab them in a headlock. I think there should be a verse of Scripture that says, put them in a holy headlock until they change. But you know, it does not say that, so we can't do that. And I just joke sometimes when I say that. Okay? But we need to understand who we are, guys. And I tried to encourage this person. Now look, I told him, you are not a vessel of dishonor. How can you be a vessel of dishonor when Jesus said you're worth it all? For God so loved you. Come on, y'all, that he gave his only son that you might have salvation and eternal life. I mean, we're not vessels of dishonor. Man, we're children of the living God. Oh, come on, y'all. Somebody should be shouting a little bit more than what you are. But listen, and it raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen to this, y'all. You want to know your place? That's where you are. You're in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if Jesus has been seated above everything, did we just read that? Principalities, powers, might, dominion, every name that is named in this age and in the age that is to come. And if he's there, you're there. You know why? Because he's made us sit together in heavenly places with him. God raised us up together, made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches, everybody say riches again, of his grace in his kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus. Listen, God wants you flowing. God wants you full of who He is. Do you realize, guys, you know, I prayed Wednesday night that God would put you in somebody's way. And I hope He did. I know some, I've heard testimony that some He did. Man, you know, that's what we need to do. You know, you need to get up every day and say, God, you know what? Put me in somebody's path today. If they headed in a bad direction, put me in there to block them and move them in the right direction. You know, don't, don't, don't let me be the type of person where I'm, I'm struggling with my day. Let me find somebody who is struggling with their day so I can be a blessing and take them in the right direction. Guys, sometimes y'all, us being in victory means we have to get somebody else there too. Now, how I many of you know, if I get up in the morning time and I just don't feel right, you know, we don't get up every day, you know, on the top of our game. But how many of you know we can read the Word and get there? And then I walk outside and I see somebody struggling. And I help them and I bless them. And all of a sudden, boom, they raise to the top. How many of you know that's going to put pep in my step? It's going to change everything about me, right? Because we were meant to be that way. We were meant to be a blessing into other people's lives. Can I get an amen there? So where's your place? 
There you go. Thank you. We got one person. No. no, you're above and not beneath. Where is your place, guys? You're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Give me an amen. Now let's go to, here. I'm stuck in Ephesians right now, so we'll call today Ephesians Day. Ephesians 5, verse 8. We're going to read 8 through 11 and then 15 and 16 and I'll close and we'll get into this a little bit more next week. Are you getting anything at all? Listen to what it says in Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. And we'll read 15 and 16. For you were once in darkness. How many of you know what that means? Anybody ever been in darkness? I mean, you know, good Lord, man. I've, God brought me out of darkness into marvelous light. Changed everything about me. How many of you are thankful for that? Man, I don't know about you, but you need to be thankful you're no longer in darkness. Do you realize, man, to be in darkness, is, you just stumble around. I mean, you just, you're at the mercy of whatever jumps out of the shadows and grabs you. But how many of you know in light, you're totally different? How many of you know when you're in light, man, everything is illuminated? Now you can figure out, you can see what's right. You can see what's wrong. You know, and you, you know Jesse Duplantis tells this story, and I think I've shared it once, but he tells a story about how he went to a church one night, and he said he kept seeing this thing poke its head out from behind, you know, from behind a dresser. And he said, um, he said, boy, I knew it was a demon. He said, I, I kept rebuking that demon. He said, all night, man, that thing would poke it. He said it would move it and poke its head out. He said, I rebuked that devil. I rebuked that devil. I come against that devil. I bound that thing up. He said, I, I, I cursed that thing. He said, I did everything I could do. And he said, it would poke its head out. And he said, finally, the next morning when it got daylight, everybody say daylight. daylight. He said he looked over and realized it was a raincoat hanging on a hanger and every time the heat would kick on, it would blow the coat out in the way. And he said, and I've been rebuking the devil all night. This is his story, not mine. Okay? And he said, he said, he said I got upset about that. And he said, I went to the Lord. And he said, I told the Lord, you let me rebuke that devil all night. Why would you do that? And he said, the Lord told him, said, yes, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Now, come on, y'all. Now, y'all listen. Here's the thing. If we're supposed to be the church, we are the church. Give me an amen there. But let's just say, the, the, and God says we have, we have tapped into the resources of heaven so that we can get a flow from God. And we're in darkness. How do we see our way? We're just like Jesse. We're having to play a guessing game. But when light enters, when that glorious light of the Word of God enters into us, how many of you know it changes the conditions of our lives so that we can begin to see? Now it's up to you if you want to stay in darkness. But you also can Uncover your spiritual eyes so you can see. And I wanted you to see this because it's so important for us to understand that we once were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Will you say that with me? Now I am light in the Lord. Can we do it again? Now I am light in the Lord. And then he goes on to say this, and this is where we'll get to next week. Walk as children of light. Now why does he tell us to do that if it's not possible? Think about this, guys. Not only does he translate us or transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Everybody say light. But then he tells us now, you've been placed here, walk like it. Oh my goodness, is that not just... Boom! I mean, think about this, y'all. Not only does he say, I'm going to put you in there and I'm making you light, but now I want you to act like it. I want you to begin to walk like you're full of light. In other words, uh, you know, and this is, I studied this out a little bit, and we'll get into it some next week, and this is the way I translate this. Walk like you're on fire. I mean, literally, that's what this is saying. Walk like you're on fire. Listen, guys, you know, when the enemy comes against you and tries to put you out, the Spirit of God can turn it around and make whatever he's sowing at you that's supposed to douse you and put you out. It'll turn the gasoline and spark you up more. 
If you'll learn how to be what God says you can be. Well, you know, I just had situations happen at work today and they really got me down and out. Well, don't let them get you down and out because down and out's not in with God. Come on, y'all, start praying over this thing. Turn it around. Turn your frown upside down. <laughs> Come on, y'all, you don't have to live that way. You just don't have to be that way. You know, um, I mean, it's just one of those things where I can surrender myself to the circumstances of life if I choose to. Or I can begin to speak the Word of God into my circumstances. And that gives fuel for change. To bring that thing up to a new level. How many of you know, I know I'm going a little bit long, but I want y'all to understand something. You are called to walk like you're on fire. Do you understand? Look at the people around you and say, it's time for you to catch fire. Come on, y'all. It's time for you to walk like you're on fire. You know what happens when you walk like you're on fire? Man, you, you gotta, you know, I had somebody tell me, he said, if you take a match and you light one match, and you take another match that ain't lit, and put it against it, you know what happens to the match that ain't lit? This is his words, I don't use ain't very often. You know what happens to the match that's not lit? When it touches fire, it gets on fire. Now those two matches begin to burn even wilder. Come on, y'all. Now what happens when you take a whole church full of matches? <laughs> and me, your pastor, is on fire. And I start getting close to you. And I like your match. Come on, man. And I get close to you. And I, match your, I like your match. Come on, y'all. What happens, y'all? We all start burning together. What, what happens? Then we catch fire. You know what that's called? Are you ready for this? Revival. <laughs> that's, what, that's the way we label it. What happens is, guys, God set us in place so that we can make a difference. We don't have to be these little poor little Christians barely making it through life with little mousy things. <laughs> We're powerhouses for God. Come on. We're powerful for God. You need to understand it's time for you to catch fire for God. It's time for you to burn for God. It's time for you to go out of here and set the highways on fire for God because that's what He's done in you. It's not time for you to be doused by life. It's time for you to get burning with the power and the fire of God and go out and set this country on fire. That's what we're called to do. Gee. I mean, this is us, guys. This is us. Will you say amen to that? Amen. We'll get into the rest of this next week. I hope you're ready for part three. <laughs> amen. <laughs> amen. Why don't you stand to your feet, guys? How many of you know God's a good God? I mean, you know, and you know, I, I believe with all my heart, He's just tired of you being where you are. Man, I tell you, I... I, I uh, I, just, I can't explain, I can't explain what happened.